Hi there, I'm Coach Lori. I'm starting a series for Women Who Podcast. We'll be talking to many women podcasters. Some have YouTube channels. We'll be talking about all things podcasts, what brought them to want to be a podcaster, how they chose maybe YouTube over podcasting, what they love about it, what challenges have come up. It's going to be a really fun time. And if you've been thinking about doing a podcast, you might want to listen in and see what people are saying. We're starting this off with a filmmaker because when I put the call out for women who podcast, Shelly Martin said, hey, what about filmmakers? And so we're going to start the series off talking with Shelly Martin, who is a filmmaker and has already won awards, but she's going to tell us about her journey of getting to be a filmmaker because she started this later in her life. I believe wholeheartedly that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And if you can teach yourself that, how to connect, how to find the people that believe the same things that you do and love and support you, no matter what, you can find them, it will change your life. Has your life, your dreams been interrupted? Good news. It is possible to reinvent our lives. People are doing it every day, and some are brave enough to share the struggles, disappointments, and challenges. If you are looking for a new beginning, a do-over, or to rediscover your passion, maybe even find a new one, then grab a cup of coffee and let's talk. Interrupted, Act 2, Reinventing Your Legacy, with your host, Coach Lori. Shelly Martin is a filmmaker, creator. She's won Best of Film with one of her films, and she's working on another one. Shelly, welcome. Tell us about your films that you have right now. Spotlight Dance, my first film. A friend of mine invited me to a film festival here in Seattle, and I'd been involved in film in the past 13 years ago. I had run a talent agency here in Seattle. There just wasn't a big need for talent. There just wasn't much going on. When I went to this film festival, I learned about all the changes that Sarah Nelson was helping create the Seattle Film Commission. And I was really excited about that because I want to try to bring film to Seattle. I got asked to be a part of this competition. I'd never made a a film before. And lo and behold, I win Best Picture for my film. And it was just so natural for me. It was about a dance studio. I love dance. It was very easy for me to show just how beautiful the studio was, the woman who ran it. I felt like I didn't do anything. I felt like I just sat there and let the magic unfold in front of me. And so that was really rewarding. And so that's what got me now producing films. And so now I'm working on my fourth That is about a Native American woman who goes missing. My production company just bought the script. We've cast the two main characters, Ella and Mitchell. And now we're working on getting the rest of my crew together to start shooting in probably early May. That is so (laughs) exciting. You said it just unfolded so naturally. But I think often when people have a gift or talent, it feels so natural. Photographers who take beautiful pictures. And then I try to take a picture of someone and it's always they're eating, blinking. There's always something. (laughs) And so I think... That there must be a gift, a talent that you see things or you envision things in a way that when you get it on the film, it's extraordinary. Yeah. To be able to help others was what I really want to do. I want to focus on documentaries. I want to focus on helping underrepresented groups. I'm also currently in talks with uh, Detective Cookie Bolden, who is a detective here in the city of Seattle. She's been here in the city of Seattle for, I believe, 30 plus years, but she has her own chess club. They actually just opened a chess park in her name uh, on Rainier Ave. And she's been on the Kelly Clarkson show. We've been in talks about me doing a documentary about her and her life and how she got here. And it's amazing when you meet her, the amount of kids, people's lives that she's changed with her acts of kindness, helping these children. She now runs chess championships. I went to one a couple weeks ago. That's so amazing. Kids going to college now because of her, because of this chess club. And it's just really amazing how she gives back. She's an amazing woman. I submitted her for the Mariners. The Mariners have honored her at their game. She's beginning to receive awards and things now for, for all of the community service she's given back. Yeah, she's amazing. That's so wonderful. So when you think about how 
now you're back into doing film and it's taking off. Do you have some, like a big hope or dream, something that you're really looking towards? Or are you kind of waiting for things to come to you? I really want to make a documentary about complex post-traumatic stress disorder because so many people struggle with that and have it and don't realize it. It's misdiagnosed all the time with depression and because some people don't realize how much trauma they had in their childhood. Like you'll talk to someone and, and they'll be like, struggling with issues of boundaries and things. And they'll be like, oh, you know, I had a perfect childhood. And then I'll be talking and then they'll go, well, there was that time my brother died. Okay. Shock and horror. <laughs> but, but people sometimes don't know mm. that they've been through trauma. I find that in my coaching all the time. People will be telling me about their great life and things that happen. For instance, a lot of people will start acting a, a certain way a certain time of year or a certain mm. date. They'll say, I don't know. I'm just off. And I'll say, well, you know, what is the date? Well, look, oh, it's April. Did something happen in April? Oh, well, that's when my mom died or that's when my whatever was murdered. It's like, hmm, you think maybe I'm so glad that that is a goal for you because in the work that I do, I really try to highlight there's a counselor, Dr. Zoe Shaw, and she talks about, so we have complex trauma, but we also then have complex shame. Oh yeah. Which that comes right along with that. So people yeah. with shame do the work of Brene Brown, which is amazing but they don't get the same results. I was left always with my trauma, even though I've done so much work, feeling like, what's wrong with me? And I love that you want to do something to highlight this because it was when I recognized I had trauma and began doing the work that doors began to open and the healing began to happen. But before that, I would overreact to situations. I, I didn't know that I had all this stuff in me that was causing me to act a certain way. Cause it, like most people, I just thought, don't all families act that way? Doesn't these things happen in all families? And I love that you're highlighting that. I'm so excited. You just gave me the idea what we were talking, you know, possibly just doing like a little Netflix series on what the differences are between depression, between anxiety, because a lot of people don't know. And when they go to their doctors, I know for me, I never told them all of my symptoms. So they're trying to guess from what information I'm giving them, which sometimes I don't even know until somebody points it out and goes, well, this looks like this. And they go, oh, that's an anxiety attack. I've been having those my whole life. I didn't know it. I love that idea because as you said, people are misdiagnosed. And I ran across this recently. If somebody was diagnosed 20 years ago, they didn't have the information. So many people with OCD maybe were on the spectrum of autism. Now we know more and we can help more. And I think about especially older women my age that have been dealing with these things and they're saying, man, I'm doing all the things everyone says to do and I'm not getting the same results. What's wrong with me? And then saying, maybe there's something we we've heard of the book, the body keeps the score. Maybe there's something. And when if you can recognize it and get in touch with it, maybe that might might begin to be more of a solution. And I love you showing the difference between depression, trauma, shame, all those things. I think would give people, it would open their eyes and they would be like, that's me. I didn't know. Yeah. You know, like years they were trying to treat me with an antidepressant, but I wasn't depressed. I just had severe anxiety. So the antidepressants never work. In fact, they actually caused you to be to suicidal. To yes. Yeah. That's terrifying. You know, suicide is on the uprise. And imagine if somebody was thinking that way, and then they realized, oh, I have trauma. And I think we talked about ACEs. Sometimes people, if they would go take that ACEs test online, mm -hmm. ACES, Adverse Childhood Experiences, they might go, oh my gosh, I have nine out of 10 trauma experiences at a child that as a child, and I didn't even know it. I mean, divorce might be, or there's so many things that we may just think we just had to get over, buck up and go on. And mm -hmm. yet they caused us to internalize so much. I did that test after, you know, everything happened with the suicidal and thing I had to do a six month patient treatment thing. And we were in this group and we were taking that test and I, I, I had 10 out of 10. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, everybody else probably does too. You know, like I'm thinking, duh, duh don't we all have this? Don't we all have this? And so we're going around the room sharing and they're like two, three. And I'm like, I'm like, what? I'm like, what's wrong with you guys? She finally had two or three. Sorry. I'd be doing so much better. Wow. I didn't realize just how much trauma I had. And you're right. People don't. No clue. There's kind of a thing of minimizing trauma. So I remember when people started to hear what PTSD was 
aside from Vietnam vets. And so then you'd hear somebody who maybe they had a fender bender, which, yeah, that's a trauma, but they like, I have P- PTSD from my trauma. I'd like, did you go to the hospital? Well, no, it's easy to blur the lines. I'm so excited about this work. I love our conversation about this because this isn't something that you just bring up. Like if I'm having a conversation with a bunch of other women, I'm not going to bring up childhood trauma, but yet when it does come up and there is a conversation, I go away feeling like I'm not alone Mm -hmm. versus what's wrong with me, Mm -hmm. which is for a long time. That's how I always felt. What's wrong with me? (laughs) And see, for me, I'm the one who does. I don't care. I just start talking to people about it right away. I'm constantly (laughs) working on myself. I don't like talking about the weather. That's very boring to me. I'd rather learn about what really makes you tick. Every time I help somebody else, it helps me. Like last night, I was sitting downstairs having dinner and next to this lady and we start chatting away and I started telling her, hey, you know, I'm becoming a life coach. I've been working on this trauma. And she's like, well, what's a life coach? Oh my God, I need a life coach. I love doing that. I love helping others. Wouldn't you rather be helped by someone who's been there, done that than somebody is that's like, oh, gee, sorry, you had such a rough childhood. But if you just do these three things, you'll be all better. Oh my gosh. And that was what I struggled with when I would go see therapists because they just sit there and they'd be like, okay, what do you need? And I'd be like, well, I don't know. Like, I don't even know where to begin. Like, I didn't even know how to communicate. And that's why I love the thought of being a life coach because I get to share my experiences with them as well. And sometimes just them listening to what decision I made or what I'm saying helps them understand about them and theirs. And then I'm not saying you should do this. I'm saying, hey, this is what I did. What do you think? I love that. Being a life coach with trauma in your title. Like if I was looking for a life coach, that would draw me in because I would be like, oh, she's going to get the trauma. I'm not going to have to sugarcoat it to make them feel better because I had such a rough childhood or I had this happen or that happen. There is a huge need for trauma life coaches. But you had talked about COVID and some things that had happened to you. You made some really big life decisions that you had to make some choices. The job I was at shortly after COVID hit, we had the shutdown. And then when we started back to work, I was in a sales job. People were mean. I mean, people would come in and look at me like I wasn't disinfecting stuff enough. And it just got to the point where the way people were treating me and others and everybody, my heart just started breaking. So I ended up going on an antidepressant, which actually had the opposite effect and it it made me suicidal. And so I ended up attempting suicide. So I ended up deciding I was going to kill myself. And I'm so chicken. The only way I did, the way I decided to do it was to quit eating and drinking. So I didn't eat for like two weeks and then I didn't drink for a week. And then I, my idealization was I was going to drive to ocean shores. That's my favorite place and, and sit by the, the water in my little chair and waste away to nothing. That was my idealized suicide attempt. But when I got over there, it was a monsoon. And so there was no sitting by the side of the beach because the wind was like 60 miles an hour sideways. No lie. Anyways, I ended up getting pulled over by a policeman. I'd been weaving in my car and uh, he pulled me over and I hadn't had anything to drink and he didn't even care. There were suicide notes written. He knew that I was missing. He knew that there were people looking for me and he pulled me out of the car and he made me blow a breath. I said, look, if I get out and blow and prove to you I'm not drunk, will you let me go? And he's like, yeah. So I got out. I blew a 0.00, but he decided that I was staggering and uh, hauled me into the hospital to have them do the blood draw. By this time, I hadn't eaten for two weeks. I mean, I'm delirious. But there was no kindness. The policeman, when he pulled me over, he never even asked me if I was okay. He pulled me over knowing that I was missing, that I was suicidal, and never once even asked me if I was okay. It really made me angry and and really makes me want to change some of the laws. If you would have pulled me over and instead of instantly, I rolled down my window and he said, you smell like alcohol. Well, I had just sprayed hand sanitizer on my hands and I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. Arguing with him about that, never once. If you rolled down the window and smelled the alcohol and gone, hey, are you okay? I got a missing report. Someone called and said, your car's leaving. Do, do you need help? I mean, imagine how far that would have gone for this suicidal woman whacked out on these drugs that were prescribed to me. So it changed my life though. But that's not an unfamiliar story. I've actually lost uh, a few friends to getting on antidepressants that weren't, didn't work with them. 
Mm-hmm. And now they have the strength to actually go through with it. While I was in the hospital, they kept giving me the same drug. And I was telling them in the, the mental hospital I was at, it was a crisis care place. I'm like, look, I'm starting to have hallucinations. My heart rate started going up. My blood pressure was like 210 over 120. I'm projectile vomiting. And they're like, you're fine. You're fine. I'm like, no, I think I need to see a doctor. So they finally called in a medical doctor who took one look at me and listened to me for five minutes and said, this girl needs to go straight to the ER. So they took me to the ER in Olympia. I met with a psychiatrist for like an hour and I told him everything and he pulled me off of every single medication and they put me on a heart monitor and they had an RN sit with me for four days and monitor me while I came down off of all of the drugs they had me on. I mean, I was bawling. I mean, I just went through all the withdrawals and everything from all this medication. And then finally, four days later, the psychiatrist is like, okay, are you feeling better? And I'm like, yeah, I'm starting to feel a little more like me. So they sent me back to the psychiatric hospital for like three days just to make sure I was okay. And then they sent me home. I'm not mad that I went through it. I'm frustrated. I think that there's a lot that could could have been done differently that could have changed the outcome for me. Maybe your next film will be on some sort of reform. Mm, I would love to talk more about police reform. It's such a hot topic though. So you got home. Did you go back to work? I mean, what shifted? How did you get out of this? I am a child of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I grew up in an incredibly violent household, uh, physically, mentally, sexually, all of the above from before I could walk really severe. You know, kind of spent my whole life in a state of depression and suicidal ideation, but was functioning. You know, I'm high functioning, good job, make good money, live in a nice place type of person. And then when COVID hit, one of the things that really changed my life is when I saw a documentary about Facebook called The Social Dilemma. And it talks about how Facebook would take people and if you uh, commented on something that was inflammatory, that irritated you, you know, if you rebuked, rebuttaled it in any way, Facebook would start sending you more things to irritate you to get you to come back more because it would engage the audience more. That's the concept that's, if you watch, it's called the social dilemma. It's old Facebook programmers that talk about how they did this. So a lot of people, after they watched it, they dumped Facebook. But I thought to myself, well, maybe I'll do the opposite. So I took my Facebook page and I turned it around to where it's all positive. The memes that I post, everything that I post is about self-help. If I had somebody on my Facebook page post any kind of Republican, any conservative, boom, booted. Yeah, I didn't care how close they were to me. If they were my kid, whatever, you're gone. Zero negatives. If I post a post, like I posted a post, I just was looking into real estate and it had the F word. And one of my friends was like, hmm, as a realtor, should you be really using the F word? Hmm, you're gone. Only positive. I now am an influencer. I have 6,500 followers. I have people contact me almost every day telling me how I've changed their lives. The memes, the things that I post have helped them get through whatever. And I've also figured out that that's how I learn. If you sit there and talk with me for an hour on a subject, I can do it, but I'm much better if it's just a meme like, hey, don't be a jerk today. I can do that. (laughs) I love it. So you took this positive approach and started putting all these positive things. And then where in there did you get back into doing film and making that your new career. After everything happened to me, you know, and I'm struggling to find myself. Actually, I had a little side note. I had a a illness that landed me in the hospital for a month and I was out of work for about a year while I was trying to heal. A friend of mine who I'd sat on a board for her production company before on her board, she approached me about going to an event. It was a film networking event. And that's where I got connected again with the film community and then heard about all the great things that Sarah Nelson, our current city council member, you know, started the Seattle Film Commission. They're trying to bring film back into Seattle. And I thought, dang, some people just said to me, Shelly, we think you'd be really good at this. And one of them handed me an opportunity to produce a film, which I did, which won Best Picture. Spotlight dance. That's so awesome. And then from there, you took on a new project. First off, I didn't make any money off of my first project. I want a little prize money, but I mean, no, you know, I, I'm going to live all that. I picked up a couple of side jobs. I worked for the Mariners part time. They love me. I'm the Mariners dancing usher. I love to dance. So I dance whenever I'm at work and 
I'm on Instagram. I'm the Mariner's Dancing Usher and I post all kinds of dance memes. And then I picked up a bartending job, you know, just stuff to bring money to pay my bills and fund my filmmaking. Kind of where I'm at right now. And then I started life coaching too. I've been through so much. My passion project in the film industry is I want to create a, a documentary about complex post-traumatic stress disorder because I think that there are a lot of us, especially people raised in the church, that have a lot of it. I'm really glad to hear you say that because I keep pointing at myself. I also have that. And I just did an interview a while back with uh, Dr. Zoe Shaw. And she talks about a lot of people talk about complex trauma, but she talks us about then what happens is we get complex shame. The Brene Brown stuff really is amazing and wonderful. But what happens if you have complex shame, you're like, wait, I did all the things and all these people are going, I feel better. I'm free. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? And mm-hmm. so I'm so glad you're delving into that because I do think there are more of us than we know because we're a certain age and we weren't allowed to talk about it. There wasn't the help when we were younger. We've learned to be high functioning. Mm-hmm. I love that you're addressing this. I think it's so important. And now that you're a coach, is that your focus? Yes, that really is what I would like to help people do. I've been through a lot of it. I've been through drinking too much. I had a big gambling problem for a long time. I've been through a lot of stuff. So I really feel like I'm well equipped yes. <laughs> to help people through a lot of the issues that they struggle with. Seriously, Shelly, in in my years of counseling and recovery and all of the things, I would much rather speak with somebody who's been there, done that, and, and can validate me than someone that has no clue and tries to give me these pat answers because they don't, they have the textbook. I've been to many therapists. I mean, from as early on as I can remember, I as a little kid, I remember thinking to myself, looking at my parents and going, they are messed up. This situation is messed up. I'd go to these therapists and be crying or trying to connect with them and they'd push a Kleenex box towards me. So that's when I started looking into, finally someone's like, you know, Shelly, what about life coaching? They're much more involved. And I, I met with one for the first time just like six months ago and I'm sitting here talking to her. I'm like, well, you know, okay, so yeah, I know that I mirror people because I'm really empathic. And so I want to work on not mirroring and setting boundaries. And I want to do this and this and this and this. And she's furiously taking all these notes. And I'm thinking to myself, I know more about this than she does. (laughs) I should be doing this. Like, because she's like, okay, let's create a goal and let's do this. And I'm like, this is cool. I can do this with people. Like, this Mm -hmm. is what I want to do. And so that's why I was like, yeah, I'm going to go into life coaching. I'm going to get me a life coach. I'd much rather do that than go to a therapist. Well, I'm started in life coach training. I love Mind Valley and Vision Lucky. Yes, I am a life coach, have been since 1999, and I teach people to become recovery coaches. I add my own little segment in there about (laughs) how we can help people who come to us with stories, because often people come to us with stories and we don't know how to respond and we respond badly. The biggest thing is I believe you, but I am so glad you are taking this step into this because I'm all for counseling. I think counseling Counseling is great, but I often refer people, find a recovery coach, find somebody that can walk with you through this because we can talk about our past all we want, but often we know enough about our past. We're ready to move to the next if we start to make those connections. And it sounds exactly like that's what you're doing. So that is amazing. Well, thank you. I love to help. I really love to serve others. I've even joked around like no matter no matter how many Academy Awards I win, I still am going to keep one night at the restaurant I work at just because I love to serve. I really enjoy doing it. I love helping others. I love helping others see the light and where they can improve their life and and sometimes just giving them a plate of food. I love that. What happened in COVID is so many people, me included, felt invisible. I'm a single woman. I live alone. I wasn't lonely. Like I had connections with my family and with Zoom, but I was alone physically all the time. And I would go to work at the radio station. Guess what? They're all working from home. I get there and the lights all go off. I'm like, wow, being seen and heard is so important. And one of the things when I teach podcasting is how we can talk in a way, even if we're talking to the masses, that we talk in a way that each person feels like they're the only one. Because I think what happened when Zoom came out is people went, oh, I'm talking to the masses when I have complex trauma and I'm in a Zoom room and you're going, hey, everybody, hey, you guys. I'm like, you don't care about me. That's not the intention of the speaker. They think they're being inclusive, but they're actually excluding that 40% of us that have ACEs, that have childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. So there's huge need for what you're doing. Not only the film, but the life coach. And man, when you combine those, look out. I know, right? 
A lot of the things that I post about on Facebook are things like just because their family doesn't mean you have to stay with them. Just because they say they like you doesn't mean that they do or have your best interests at heart. I was the youngest of five children. I was always just told what to do. I never knew how to set a boundary. I never knew how to stand up for myself. I never knew how to advocate for myself. I never knew how to say no and, and, and mean it and find my own voice. And I, that's, I just really want to help other people. Of course, focus on women. I'm always wanting to help the underrepresented. I just want to help others grow, set boundaries, learn how to live healthy. What is so beautiful is when we can use our experience to then kind of reach our hand back and take the next person up with us. And I love that you say, I want to stay at my restaurant because I just want people to feel seen and heard. Okay, so tell me the name of the film you already did is called? Oh, the film that won Best Picture is called Spotlight Dance. The film that I'm working on now is called Something Must Break. I just decided to brand myself as Shelly of the City. So I'm Shelly of the City. That's my website. Yeah, that's my production company is Shelly of the City Productions. And it's hashtag Shelly of the City. Shelly of the City, Shelly of the City Life Coach. It's so powerful when we can finally get the help we need and not feel like what is wrong with me, but basically what is right with me? I am so high functioning. I've survived all of these things. And now there's a coach that can walk me through this. Right. I believe wholeheartedly that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And if you can teach yourself that, how to connect, how to find the people that believe the same things that you do and love and support you no matter what, and they're out there, they're just a little harder to find. If you can find them, it will change your life. Wow. Shelly, thank you. You're welcome. If you love this podcast, here's a big ask. Will you share with your friends and family, subscribe, give us a review, and a five-star rating so that others looking to reinvent their lives will be able to get the help they're looking for. Thank you in advance.